This podcast is supported by Siemens, your partner for industrial grade AI. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of our Industrial AI podcast. My name is Robert Weber, and it's a pleasure to talk to Peter Seberg. As always, good morning, Robert. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are, dear listeners around the world. Peter, after so many use cases in the in the last week, today I'm looking forward to an episode with Professor Dr. Frank Hutter, the father of AutoML. Right. More about that in the main part. Let's start with our news. What do you have? Okay, I've got a couple. And first one is that according to the research document by Capgemini, that's a French IT company, for those of you that do not know. Consulting, right? A consulting company. I thought it was yeah, IT services as well. They, they, Many of them do both, right? Scaling AI in manufacturing operations. They say that Europe is leading the way in industrial AI with more than half of its top manufacturers implementing at least one use case, AI use case in manufacturing operations. Uh, they say within Europe, Germany leads the pack with 69% of its manufacturers implementing AI, then followed by Japan, 30%, and the US, 28%. Yeah, it's been a very popular article to read. Almost 40,000 people, for some whatever reason, were interested. A lot of discussion. I will uh, recall two, three of them. Ralph yep. Schiffler was there, Pressgate. He questions the definition for manufacturing by putting both, that was very interesting, the production of Mars bars as well as manufacturing a propulsion system for the next Mars um, a trip into one basket. Um, then we had uh, Jürgen Schmizek from Tvarit saying that the study only represents a small fraction of the market. Uh, he says only 300 of the top manufacturing companies worldwide across various industries. And the main problem, he says, remaining data availability and quality. Then we have uh, Fabian Schlades. He is from Capgemini. Mm -hmm. And he then confirms that the report looks at the top 75 organizations by annual global revenue in each of the four segments, industrial manufacturing, automotive, consumer products, and aerospace. Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll do one more. Uh, there are so many. <laughs> uh, Fred Simkin, he is from SmartFix LCC. I'm actually going to be talking to him in the next couple of weeks uh, about industrial AI in the United States. And he says that uh, on this side of the Atlantic, we can only watch and drool, pun intended, the tool vendors either go vertical outside the industrial space or to unconditionally or consciously steer away from the space because, as a salesman told him, they don't speak factory. So more about this with Fred in the next couple of weeks. There's a couple of more. And what I did then maybe to close off this part is uh, I think the two pictures are in the meantime maybe four or five years old already. Uh, I went to Brussels, um, you know, at the, at the beginning of our podcast yeah, time, yeah, yeah. at the beginning of my doing, you know, AI consulting. And there was a an activity going on by EFRA. EFRA is the European Factories of the Future Research Association. Uh, and at the very end of it, there were about 250, I believe, researchers, you know, most of them people from, from Europe. And they were asking, who's ahead in AI? And I recall, and that you can see it on the picture, it was actually Thomas Hahn from Siemens. And I, I, we know him from OPC UA, right? Mm -hmm. And he was commenting on the results. We see the picture on the general who is leading AI. And people said, you know, it's the USA, you know, 56%, Asia, 27%, and Europe is uh, far behind with 17%. And while Thomas was commenting, he's standing up on that picture, you know, the people were giving the answer to the second question, which was who's ahead in industrial AI. And out came at that time, you know, Europe 63%, um, USA 26%, and China 11%. So these numbers, of course, uh, that I am now sharing are by no means scientific or representative. 
Uh, we'll leave them uh, that and we will see if European companies will be leading or continue to lead the way in industrial AI. Uh, and maybe on the base of uh, US technology, that was another comment that was made. I think it's very interesting that you record an episode with this guy from the USA and uh, because they don't speak factory language. That's very interesting. Yeah. We have heard that before. And of course, this is not going to be about uh, USA bashing or no, no. Or, this, or, for, or for the same time putting European companies in the space where maybe they partly do and partly do not belong. And already saying now, um, Uh, you know, of course, most uh, most of the base technology that we're using uh, is from the United States, you know, to, to put it out already. Uh, but yeah, interesting. We, as you say, we've heard that uh, before. Um, and he's been commenting a couple of times on uh, things that I've been putting out. So it would be, would be interesting to see. And maybe we move on with the second. Yeah, move on. Well, I have this point, which is, goes here directly, okay. which is, you know, that Andrew Wang and his landing AI, yeah. you know, that uh, and he's seeking to democratize AI for all company sizes. You know, he, as a, as far as I'm aware, at least U.S. Uh, a citizen and one, if not the number one driver, you know, I did his course on introduction to machine learning, whatever, six, seven, eight years ago. His solution, and that just went live, I believe, called Landing Lens. Uh, he promises to uh, facilitate, that's a quote-unquote, swift creation, testing of computer vision AI projects without the need for intricate programming skills applying AI experience. He says, we started by exploring the manufacturing sector, one of the hardest industries in which to deploy computer vision. That's a very interesting quote from him. And then, and then we found, he says, the tools we had built for manufacturing with relatively few modifications can also be useful for many other computer vision applications. Interesting, and I haven't tried it out yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. He says, landing lens is available for a free trial coupled with a new pricing scheme that enables pay-as-you-go usage beyond the trial. Now, I had hoped for a lot of discussion, and maybe we can do a little bit right now, because I wanted to know, for some of the people that I copied, including Case, Case Snook, who's going to be our main speaker you know, in AI in the Alps. Maybe you can say a bit about that. And nobody really reacted. Fred did, but we'll hear from him in a couple of weeks. I wanted to know, is this really now structurally new? Or, as we have learned from Andrew in the past many, many times, He concentrates on the data rather than the algorithms, right? Maybe you, you recall. And I'm, I'm very much interested from you, listeners, and also now from you, Robert. I'm, I'm surprised about his approach to, to, to start with computer vision in the industrial sector because, in my opinion, we see a lot or many solutions in, in, in robotics, in automation, mm. uh, in the industrial sector. So. I'm really surprised about that and about the quote. Um, we will see what's coming. You're right. It's it's interesting. It is a quote unquote here. That is not. Uh, I had that from Venture Beat, I believe. So he must have done an interview. Uh, you, you said <laughs> you you wrote this morning. I hadn't seen that Landing AI had actually reacted. Yeah. To my piece on LinkedIn, uh, I have asked in the past, Andrew. I've invited Andrew, yeah, Andrew. to come to our podcast. Uh, Andrew, if you're listening or if your colleagues from Landing AI are listening, we are very much interested in have you on our podcast. And uh, yes, I must agree with you, Robert, because I just read it out kind of. He says one of the hardest industries in which to deploy computer vision. And yes, you and I know that we, uh, not only in Europe, but of course, we more specifically know from the European range of companies that have been dealing with computer vision for many, many, many years. Not only the the original, you know, the pixel base, but also the new yeah. machine learning based computer vision. I recall we had, you know, four years ago in one of our first uh, yes, uh, yeah. episodes, we did talk about exactly that um, topic. Yeah. So that's interesting why uh, he's putting it that way. He must have his reason. That's number one. And number two, um, yeah, number, number two, there is the, what he says, the pay as you go. I'm not sure that we 
have seen that before. That's an interesting mm -hmm. piece. And then the, the third thing, we have talked about it in the past, I believe. You know, he's always said, you know, don't don't tweak your algorithm another, you know, way or two or three. Uh, he's always been, he has had his data-centric approach, right? So it seems that in his approach, he's always looking at uh, make sure that you have clean, as clean as possible data. Make sure that your labels, that there is not somewhere in your labels, there is an error, a mistake. And he has algorithms, I believe, which is almost counter speaking what I said before, but looking at maybe, you know, of a thousand um, labels, one or two or five of them are wrongly labeled. And he seems to be doing that. That's the, So there's, there's more detail to it there. So I think, again, I'm very much interested. If, yeah. if not, number one, of course, we want to hear from Andrew. Sure. If he will be interested, if he has 30 minutes for us sometime, uh, but also from you, from you listeners, you know, if you can have a look at it and uh, let us know, what do you think? Is this something structurally new that we can, all of us, uh, learn from? And yeah, and, and Peter, we should record an episode with Landing uh, about that topic because that's very, very interesting. Yeah, exactly. So... Yeah. Let's move on. I, I have uh, one more news concerning great language model, uh, because at the weekend, Jan Lecan presented Lama, and I have one quote. The models have been trained on trillions of tokens and show that it is possible to train state-of-the-art models using publicly available datasets exclusively without resorting or propriety and inaccessible data sets mm -hmm. and media is committed to open research and releases all the models the research community under gpl version free license so i will put the the link to the paper on and the github and the blog post in our show notes and there we have a new large language model now something from media I was going to ask, is, and you, over the weekend, I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't heard, there was a quote from him that I thought that you were going to share. What was that about? Oh, yeah, that was about a, a specific um, programming language from yeah, a specific yeah. company. I thought you were going to do that. I haven't heard about this. Uh, interesting that he's, uh, again, what is, yeah, again, talking about size, right? Yeah. You know, as if... I believe, and I'm, I'm more of the opinion or supporter of the opinion of those scientists, AI research scientists that know a lot better than I, at least from my feeling. And as I say, supporting that, you know, size is not going to bring it. I did actually have a, another one as well. Is it called you.com? You haven't heard. You.com is from, maybe you can look at the same time. It's from the German guy who was the, the research scientist at, was it salesforce.com? Maybe we'll find out in the next couple of seconds. And he is doing the approach that I am a strong a fan, believer of combining is as what we have said, you know, 50 years ago, good old fashioned AI on symbols, symbols like, you know, structure, graphs putting relationships between this is a table and these are chairs they are somehow related and they're very they are further away from trees with, that i see outside yeah. but maybe a plant or flowers are standing whatever that's on one side and the sub symbolic as it was called you know we've done our and that's what you.com is actually you mean richard Socher, right there you go richard yeah, yeah. yeah. richard is the guy and richard at the time when we talked about it he was using machine learning for you could almost say a better world. It was doing uh, systems of, let's say, who pays uh, how much uh, tax, how can we uh, create tax systems in a way using, I believe it was reinforcement learning even, or like a game, yeah. Yeah, and that's why. And he, he, he left, obviously, and I had seen, uh, and, and actually Andrew was talking about him, Okay. Interesting as well. And he's one example of saying, you know, you, you cannot use just any kind of content. So he does go on the website. Uh, he does this combination of what Google is, has been doing for 20 years, you know, go on the website and, and have a look uh, and then give the list. And he then puts on top 
of that, he puts down a language model and says, I'm not looking at the billions or trillions of data, including all the great things and all the crap, you know, because that's what we humans kind of represent, not only the good things, but also the bad things. No, I look at this content, whatever, you know, I look at this company, at this this theme, and, and then I apply my language model on this information that I have in front of me. I believe mm-hmm. that's that's the base idea. So, uh, interesting to and, see. And what, he worked for Salesforce, that's right. At the time, yeah, but he is the founder, I believe, and CEO of yeah, yeah. Com. And that is the example that Andrew gave in his uh, paper at the same time where he did announce uh, in his new or, the, or landing AI. Or No, that was the deep learning. I'm okay. not sure in how far they are related. But Oh, interesting. I, I will uh, I will have a look at what uh, what Jan is, is then this time proposing. You know, I, yeah. I hope that this time, what must I say? You know, it's a month ago that his language model, which had to do with scientific papers, only, you know, left, what, 24, 48 yeah. hours? Yeah. And then I had to took it offside. So I hope it's going to be there a bit longer this time. But again, I... I'm not a believer that this approach of going bigger and bigger all the time is going to help us um, providing with high quality uh, answers from language models. I don't believe it. Go on, Peter, hurry up. Frank, who are you waiting? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a very quick one on uh, on language models. <laughs> I was a note, it was in German. Uh, it said that uh, ChatGPT is making a career as a writer on Amazon. It seems. Uh, it was an article somebody else that AI generated books are flooding Amazon's Kindle store. ChatGPT and other bots are listed as authors or co authors of at least 200 books. <laughs> so, dear listeners, if you want to read a book in German that is about industrial AI or an introduction to AI written by real humans, like in this case, Robert or myself, go and have a look. You know, yep. it seems that we were just in time, <laughs> Robert. When did we do our introdu- industrial AI? Three years ago, I think. I think three years ago, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So we wrote a book, and then there was a second book that I did. So uh, go for it, um, for a book by real human beings. Yeah, do you have one more news? So- one more, yeah. Actually, two. Uh, yeah, I've been suggesting as people may have known for years to initiate a global organization against the use of autonomous weapons uh, similar to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which is in The Hague, yep. uh, which is um, you know in the Netherlands, where I'm from. Uh, and that's why I was very proud to see my country, fellow man, they host a summit where a government representatives agreed on a joint call to action on the responsible development, deployment, and use of artificial intelligence in the military domain. Uh, one comment, uh, that's interesting, right? It's not, it's already in the two things that I said. It's not this time about just forbidding. Um, it's about responsible development, deployment, and use of AI. That's interesting. I think five years ago, we talked about forbidden, and now we, we talk about responsible use. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and and what that means in detail, those of you listeners that are maybe, you know, inside of uh, that industry, you know, uh, in Germany, there has been for, you know, not so nice reasons, of course, a huge uh, development in this direction. And we, we quickly move into the political atmosphere, which we do not want to do. But nevertheless, you know, there is development of these systems around the world. And for those of you, uh, that are in that market and listening, you may want to go and, and look into what that means, what then this responsible development, deployment and use means. And by the way, uh, interestingly, uh, I will be at the, the Munich University of the Armed Forces next week, um, uh, which is very close to where I'm living here, actually in the suburbs of Munich. Uh, where the official handing over of the award from the German government for Ernst Dickmann's ah, uh, f- yeah. as the inventor of the autonomous driving. As you recall, he was doing his research in the 1980s and 90s exactly on uh, the premises of uh, of this University of the Armed Forces. Um, so uh, there may be people uh, at that time exactly talking about this topic yeah. I have one more news or one more article. Do you know Arduino, the small microcontroller? Yeah, I haven't used it, but yeah, I know it. And Microsoft Research India's 
um, they have an HML tool and that enables you to perform machine learning tasks such as gestural recognition mm -hmm. on a tiny device like Arduino Uno. And according to the developers, you might need as little as two kilobyte of RAM. Two kilobyte of RAM. There's mm -hmm. no network connection required and then work is using TensorFlow underneath. Mm -hmm. And so it's compatible with much of what you will find for bigger computers. One, mm. it's not a computer, it's a microcontroller, but mm -hmm. I think it's very, very interesting. You can, I will put the whole article in mm. our show notes and then everybody can read how to use Arduino and machine learning. Yeah. Yeah. Brings me back to the discussion we had on exactly the same topic at that time. It was OPC UA for those of you that are not aware. Uh, it's the um, information architecture for the industry standard. And at that time, as I was with one of the companies providing those solutions into the market, and they were, you know, getting smaller and smaller, and the, 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 the hardware solutions were getting more capable all the mm -hmm. time. It was always about what is it at that time, what can you put into the smallest available microcontroller yeah so I, I recall that at the time and maybe we're talking now exactly those six seven years back that um, you could put specific the core elements of opc ua at that time into a specific solution i think it was fpga whatever it was right. Uh, and maybe others you could not, and that would mean that maybe you had had to put um, not use security, whatever. So that was the same solution. And of course, it's all about Moore's law. Moore's law continue to move on and giving us uh, more uh, value for the same money um, every year. And there's a Arduino industrial firmware or industrial application and this is also providing opc ua on arduino so it's very interesting uh, everybody should do their own research on arduino but i think it's very interesting yeah i got a close off quick one ade soji alu i hope i pronounce his name correctly he's a machine learning engineer from lagos nigeria he has worked in the automotive industry migrating ideas research for better informed decisions using machine learning algorithm tools through to production is open for work. So if you're interested, dear listener, for your company, for your environment, you may be able maybe to provide him with a position. You can contact him directly on LinkedIn, maybe. A-D-E-S-O-J-I, Soji Alu, A-L-U, or contact me, Peter, at AIPod, uh, D E. Perfect. That was it for today. Mm, not at all, because now we have oh. the main part with yeah, Frank. Yeah, 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 right. That's what yeah. I meant for the news. And by the way, sometimes I go back into our podcast, and 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 Dan. I think this week I saw Frank. You know, <laughs> we. I mean, we have been talking about. You know, four years ago. Yeah, I it's, think so. It said somewhere, which was it? Maybe it had to do with Anne Stigmans. It was around that time. It was 2019. And I believe, I, and yeah, yes, it was that one because I've been listening back to it. And then I said, okay, yeah, after our new section, I'm going to contact Frank and, uh, and see that we get an interview with him. So that's taken us a little bit of time, but then now you did record a, a session with Frank, right? Yeah, about TAP PFN, and we will listen now in the main part. Thank you very much, Peter. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Robert. Have a good day. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> My guest today is Professor Dr. Frank Hutter from the University of Freiburg, one or the father of the AutoML approach. He wrote the first book on AutoML, Methods, Systems, Challenges, together with Lars Kotthoff, who have been our guest at the very beginning of this podcast. A few weeks ago, Frank published an article and talked about the revolution of data science. I thought, wow. We need to talk about that. And hello, Frank. Greetings to Freiburg. Hello, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Glad you could join us. Your revolution is called TEP-PFN. What does it mean and what can the approach do? First, I should probably clarify I, this revolution. So I, I think it's a really revolutionary um, technique that it, it might lead to a complete change of paradigm in how we classify tabular data. The particular 
classification algorithm that we have learned is very strong, but it doesn't replace everything so far. So some people have um, gotten that wrong when they said, oh, this this may revolutionize. At the LinkedIn post, you have to make a revolution. Otherwise, nobody will see it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I, I really think the approach may in the future revolutionize the field of tabular learning. So what is it? It is an approach. It, it blew my mind um, to, to start with, but it's an approach that basically applies deep learning to small tabular data sets. So um, maybe to back up a little bit, what is a tabular data set? It's something like an, an Excel sheet, a CSV file that has one column and uh, that, that needs to be predicted given the other columns. And yeah, you have your standard classical algorithms like random forest, XGBoost, SVMs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so everything that you sort of learn in machine learning 101. And those algorithms are programmed by human. And TAPPFN is now the first classification algorithm that is actually learned. So it is a, a big neural network. It happens to be a transformer. It could also be some other network. And it is learned to accept a data set, the training data set, X train, Y train, as an input. And then also the query points, so the, the X test, so the all the columns for the new data points that you know, and then it predicts Y test, the column that, that you should predict, in a single forward pass. So it takes in all the data as an input, does a forward pass, and does a prediction. And this forward pass takes a second, whereas usually deep learning hasn't been that successful on tabular data. It's really been in this one area where deep learning hasn't really taken over. Um, it has already taken over an image and speed and, and all these raw data domains where it, it's really important to engineer your features um, automatically on the raw data. Tabular data, on the other hand, typically has a lot of very well engineered features already that are engineered by the domain expert. And deep learning hasn't had as much of a grasp on that yet. And classical deep learning algorithms tended to overfit on small data and tended to be very slow in comparison to um, tools like XGBoost. So the machine is learning machine learning. Yes, it's really our first approach where we learn a learning system. Isn't that scary? <laughs> it, it's somewhat scary, but you know, it, it's not learning a new learning algorithm that can learn anything, but it, it learns to do tabular classification and, and it learns it. So, so you can also see it sort of as, as a different paradigm of programming. So we, we still tell the machine something in order to learn this algorithm, but we don't tell it, you know, for example, in a random forest, you, you say, well, you take your columns, you sort them, then you order, you pick the feature that is the most expressive, um, giving you the best division of your data, then you do this recursively, etc. We We don't do any of that, but rather we describe what is the data that we expect that the system will be fed in the future and that it should actually classify well on. So it is really basically we tell it the types of problems to expect and the solutions for those problems. And we tell it millions of those um, synthetically generated. And then it learns to solve this task. And while we know neural networks are universal function approximators, and well, they're also transformers it can also basically mimic algorithms because algorithms in the end of the day, um, this is just a function mapping from the X train, Y train, X test to Y test, and they can learn this. In your paper, you wrote TAP PFN happens to be a transformer, happens to be a transformer, but this is not our usual trees versus nets battle. What does it mean? So it is a particular type of neural network. It, it is a network that can accept a set valued input. You could have also done this with so-called deep sets, et, et cetera. Transformers are, well, happen to be the most on, on vogue neural architecture these days. On vogue is very nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're, they're just extremely easy to get going. And while well, all the learning algorithms work well for it, the you know, optimizers, I, I think sort of the machine learning community is there's sort of a co-evolution of architectures and optimizers and hyperparameter defaults and so on. And everything sort of just works for transformers. But there might be a new architecture in five years that's much better than transformers that also accepts sets. And then, then that would also just work um, beautifully. I think four or five episodes, I talked to Jürgen Klambauer from University of Linz. 
and he described new paradigms of machine learning. Is TAP PFN a new paradigm? Um, I, I would say it can really start a new paradigm for tabular data because it's the first algorithm that is actually now learned. And I, I don't think we will see a whole lot more manually programmed algorithms for tabular classification. I mean, the ones that we have um, will um, continue to have their use cases, but I, I think as we scale up TabPFN, and, and so just, I, I should also mention, there is still a lot of limitations of TabPFN to date. The limitations so far, actually, the technique is limited to small data. So this is something that we really focused on and something that other methods can't do very well. If you have five data points, it's perfectly fine. You can actually use a TabPFN for this. And it, it seems ludicrous to use a neural network if you have uh, five data points. And I can talk more about how we, how we solve this later. But, but so it, it can do that. It can't currently deal with two large data sets because, well, we actually use this transformer and transformers are quadratic in the number of input data points. There are modern variants of transformers that might only be n log n or O of n in the input data. So this is not an insurmountable problem, but the software we have released has, has this limitation. It's also limited to up to 100 features, so only 100 columns that we can accept. That's really not, not a fundamental limitation either, but we want a, oh, of course, we want a classification method that doesn't just work for binary data, or that doesn't just work for classification with, with three different classes, but it should accept sort of an arbitrary number of classes. But we had to set an upper limit because well, that, that's sort of the input dimensionality um, of this set that goes into the transformer. And we sort of arbitrarily set that up to a, a maximum of 100. And if we have less classes, then we just pad with zeros. But if you have 101 classes, then you just can't use it. We could train a new transformer that works up to 1,000, and it would just take 10 times longer to train. And um, nobody has really complained so much that it only accepts up to 100 features. In the future, we can we can easily re resolve this. It's also limited so far. It does much better on numerical features because that, that's also something that we we very much focused on. You can apply it for uh, for categorical data, but we haven't really tried to get the most out of it. And at some point, I should talk about how we actually did this in terms of um, yeah. How do you solve this problem with the amount of data? With the amount of data, there's many, many possible ways for solving it. So one is, is actually using these more modern architectures for transformers that are n log n. But we could also, you know, take a subsample of the data and apply the with a thousand data points and apply the top BFN to that and then apply and take another thousand and apply it to that and build an ensemble. Or we could do an SVM type approach where we actually get support vectors, what are the important data points. And we actually have various implementations along these lines. And I'm, I'm very, very positive that, that this will work very well. Frank, how did you come up with it? Who had the idea and why? How, how the idea was born? Well, so this is a follow-up paper to a previous paper we had. Um, the previous paper was called Prior Data um, Fitted Networks, so PFNs. And the idea for that, that came from my PhD student, um, Samuel Muller. It's funny, he's in my lab, he is sort of a heretic because I, I have this lab on AutoML and then we're really, yeah, we're aiming to be the world leaders in AutoML. And he always is like, oh, you know, I, I don't really believe fully in this AutoML. I, <laughs> I'm just going to come up with something that, that beats it. <laughs> and I'm just going to use um, all the tricks of deep learning. He, he worked at, he was a research engineer in the company for many years before he's awesome with PyTorch he knows everything and he yeah is, is really strong in transformers and so on and, and so he said well I'm, I'm just gonna learn in transformer to do this problem to solve this problem and uh, well he did <laughs> yeah sure he did and and so this, this prior work that was much limited in scope and we we also had a tabular um, experiment in there that was up to 30 data points and we're up to a thousand I think next year we're probably gonna be at 10,000 or so I come back to your PhD colleague. Is it a further development of AutoML or is this a subcategory or a completely new approach? So AutoML is a big field and um, AutoML includes this field of neural architecture search and this field of hyperparameter optimization, but also this field of meta learning. And so learning to learn AI that builds AI, et cetera, that all goes under AutoML. And well, th this is one particular type of meta learning because yeah, we, we learn a learning algorithm. 
So it, it's clearly AutoML in that sense. But actually, if you apply this to tabular data now, then it sort of doesn't use all the tricks yet that we use in other AutoML tools. Like in AutoSQL Learn, we have all kinds of ensemble techniques and, and so on. And you can, yes, you can easily take TabPFN and ensemble it with some classical algorithms, some random forests and so on. And we have actually done that and that improves performance a lot. So so we haven't, haven't even... Um, a lot means um, what? Well, it, if you just take, for example, a random forest and a simple TabPFN, then the random forest is about the same um, speed as TabPFN. And then you get something that's already better. So I mean, for numerical data, the TabPFN by itself is better than AutoSQL Learn in an hour, where it TabPFN runs for a second, but for categorical data, it's not so clear. But if you also throw in a random forest that is a second and you assemble it with the TabPFN, then you're also already at the at where AutoSQL Learn is in an hour. Um, so there is, there is some complementarity in the benefits you get from different classification algorithms. And, and as I mentioned, we haven't focused on categorical data and the random forests are particularly good at categorical data. Yes, we will. Maybe, maybe I should briefly talk about how we scaled up from the previous paper to TabPFN because that's really where we focus on tabular data and where we, where we exploit some knowledge of, of what we expect tabular data to look like. And that's also where I can, where I can say this is where we focused on numerical, on, not on categorical data. And, and so the, the way you build a new algorithm with, with TabPFN is to actually, well, we need to specify what is the data that we expect. And so basically, what the lead student of this paper did, and he is a Noah Holman. He is a, technically a research engineer with me now and in a 20% side job, but he is actually a PhD candidate at, at Charité in the medical department. <laughs> so, and um, he knew Sam and yeah, they, they did their bachelor together. They drank yeah. a beer together and then they're there. Yeah. Well, they, they did their bachelor together and um, he, he got to know of, of the PFN uh, very early and actually joined the paper also. Um, just before we finish it, but but Sam had the original idea for that. But then Noah said, "Let's let's really focus, let, let's really scale this up to tabular data, to larger tabular data sets." And and medicine actually has a lot of lot, these yeah. um, data sets. That well, the thirty data points is a little bit too too small, but a hundred data points, hundred fifty, two hundred, maybe a thousand. That those are the domains that that Noah really also wanted to tackle. And Noah was really the the one who looked at. Okay, what, what do we expect tabular data to look like? So he came up with a prior that we sample these, these training data sets from. And I mentioned we sample millions of these training data sets from the synthetic prior. And, and this prior is, is what Noah designed. And he designed it to, well, in the original paper, we already had a neural network prior. So there we, we said, well, the, the data might have been generated from some sort of neural network that has takes some input x and then does some combinations of that x and in the end at some point um, out comes a y and and we don't quite know the connections we don't know the architecture of this neural network so you can sample an architecture and then sample the weights of this architecture and and this original approach that then did bayesian inference over this space of architectures and the space of weights so um, the original paper is what was called transformers can do bayesian inference and this new paper, what he did on top of that is to actually think more about, well, tabular data might not come from a neural network, that there might be um, causal relationships between the different columns. So he, he dove pretty deep into the literature on causal learning and actually um, wrote this prior for um, structural causal models where you have some inputs to a graph and then these inputs are combined in various ways. And then like there, there's really these causal relationships in, in this graph and, and the X and the Y we actually have in the end are not necessarily the inputs and the outputs of the structural causal model, but it could also be that the Y causes the X and we only observe the X, but we actually care about the Y. And so we just express our uncertainty about where um, in this network, all the different components are and how sparse the connections are, etc. And on top of that, he also put in a prior that we expect the function to be learned to be actually pretty simple. We, we expect that there's not too many connections in this network, not, not too many latent variables that are not observed, etc. And that was important to actually not overfit. So yeah, the, the prior is, is that if you really don't know much about the data, if you have like three data points, 
then probably you're going to expect that it's a pretty linear relationship. And if you have thousands of data points, then it's also possible to come up with this really complex model that fits that much more complex uh, relationship really well. I want to come back one step before when we talked about AutoML. AutoML takes time, it's expensive, consumes, resources. Is that solved with TAP PFN? Not really, right? So I had two answers to this. The, the first is it's everything wrong. It's it's not it's not expensive. Uh, AutoML, if done naively, is extremely expensive. And AutoML, well, what we coined the term with the AutoML workshop and so on that, that we started in 2014 and, and held yearly afterwards. But in the public, AutoML really was coined as a term by a project by Google Brain that used reinforcement learning for neural architecture search training 12,800 different networks in order to find a network for CIFA 10, which is a small data set that was okay. And, and so that is ludicrously expensive. And, and that is, that is sort of what's stuck in pub, in the public mind is that AutoML is expensive. And I'd like to modulate this a little bit saying there is also a lot of work that really tries to make AutoML efficient and um, for example, you can use multi-fidelity optimization. Multi-fidelity means you can, for example, use less epochs of your network, less depth, less widths, et cetera, to, to come up with proxies of your this expensive function that you're optimizing, namely the performance of your architecture, the performance of hyperparameters, et cetera, and, and do a lot of optimization in this proxy space and then only scale up slowly and, and basically um, only evaluate one big architecture in the end. And one of the goals that, that we have in AutoML is really to, to push this to the limit of maybe you have an overhead of three or five function evaluations, not 12,800. And, and that is, is actually something that the human engineers, when they optimize their system, they typically actually use more budget than this. And, and so we're really trying to be, to be more um, sample efficient um, than humans in, in the AutoML process. Uh, so that was the first answer. Yep. And the second one. AutoML is not necessarily uh, expensive. And now TAP PFN, yes, I, I do think it it's basically solves this problem because we train this transformer once and that was during algorithm development and we, we, we never needed to touch it again. And then given the new data set, you actually just feed the data set into the transformer, do a forward pass, that takes a second, done. And, and so you can see this as green AutoML. Green AutoML, okay, that's yeah. nice. But of course, you could then do things on top, uh, assemble it and so on in order to, yeah, maybe it's okay to spend a minute. You, you don't need to spend then, yeah, 800 GPUs for two weeks, as this um, paper did that I mentioned that gave this notion that, that AutoML is really expensive. But tabular data tends to actually be relatively cheap. And, and there we don't really have this problem typically that we, we really need to squeeze out the last little bit. If, if it takes five minutes or it takes 10 minutes, it doesn't really Man, make yep. a difference. Yeah. But with a tap PFN, it takes a second and that, well, that becomes then That's more a real different. time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then if you take the second to just enter a new value somewhere and in that time, the tap PFN already makes your prediction. So it, so you can really interact with it. The, the way you interact with a uh, chat GPT, et cetera. It's, it's very, actually there, there is, clear similarities between um, GPT-3 and, and TAP-EFN because it's, you could see the TAP-EFN as you feed in a sequence, a prompt that's like x1, y1, x, y2, x3, question mark, and it fills in y3. And that's precisely how GPT-3 was trained. Yeah, I want to stop this point because everybody talks about chat GPT and chat GPT-3 or 4. And the topic machine learning is discussed in many media. Many people have their first touch with the technology, want to try it themselves. Does it help the AutoML approach? What do you think? Does it help the AutoML approach? That's an interesting question. You can definitely think of using ChatGPT. I think in particular, it's, it's a sort of gain knowledge about all the data in the world and all the texts in the world to come up with some priors. So you can say, well, I'm training a ResNet for CIFAR 10. What should I put as a learning rate? And we have actually tried that with ChatGPT and it tells you, oh, you probably want to start with a learning rate around this. And so it gives you good default uh, or good, good priors. And those priors can then go into Bayesian optimization. And we have a, a couple of papers recently 
that actually accept human priors. And well, this wouldn't be a human prior, but it's a prior over the human knowledge that is distilled by ChatGPT to tell you what, what's actually a good starting point. And that can also reduce the resources a lot. Um, actually, in one of our papers, we got an order of magnitude speed up by using um, priors. The flip side, I also wanted to briefly comment on, AutoML can also definitely help systems like ChatGPT because uh, somewhere uh, they need to come up with the hyperparameters for, for these systems. And the way it's done right now is well, there is human machine learning engineers that do this manually, that try yeah on subsets of the data, on smaller architectures and so on. And they, they try and, and try and, and then cross our fingers and hope, yeah, I, I think that's probably going to work. But you can actually collect a lot of data in the space, data about how well different configurations perform with different fidelities, and then build a model and, and do more than cross your fingers, but actually have proper probabilistic estimates about what will be the performance of the system when you scale up. You can use these scaling laws, etc. There's a lot that can be done, and I'm pretty sure that in a couple of years from now, we will actually see a lot of these systems be optimized, not manually, but automatically, because there are efficient optimizers out there um, by now. In my opinion, we will see a lot of people using AutoML tools because they are now fascinated by ChatGPT and want to try it by themselves, but they are not have not the capabilities to do that and using a lot of more AutoML tools, or I'm wrong. Yeah, that, that might happen. I don't know. I mean, so what I've what I've seen mostly from people who are new to AI because of ChatGPT is if they, they sort of want this uh, natural language um, interface. And that is something that is pretty unique to ChatGPT. I must say that they did an awesome job there. But when you want to build then your own application, when you have actual algorithms and you want to um, get the most out of it, and, and you then finally, or, or you have data sets, you have small data sets, and now you see, hey, actually, maybe maybe I can use machine learning then people will actually try machine learning and don't know what to use. And then they'll, AutoML is a clear thing that they should start with. Our podcast is called Industrial AI, Frank. How can the users from the industrial sector benefit from TAP PFN and AutoML? We have made clear, but how they can benefit from TAP PFN? Yeah, so I think also in the industrial sector that there must be a lot of data sets where you don't have a lot of data. Absolutely, a lot. I don't know, for example, predictive maintenance or um, machining um, data. Um, you have lots of time series data sets. We, we haven't worked on time series yet, but that's also one of the quite natural successors that we could look into. For that, but one would need to build a prior over what do typical time series look like. That's sort of all you would need to do. And you, you specify this prior and then you more or less click go learn an algorithm for this prior. And, and that takes a day on one machine. So it's not crazy. It, it's not taking thousands and thousands of machines for a year. And it doesn't take the 5 million that GPT-3 to train. <laughs> and yeah, then, then you can actually um, directly get going. So, so I think there, there's a lot of yeah small data in this field, and that's why um, obviously that would be great. And AutoML in, in general is not limited to small data, and like, the future of and is also not. One more question: You are working on this time series topic, or is it a plan for the future? So, in particular, with TAPFN, we're not working on time series yet. We do have an AutoML system that also um, covers time series. So we have um, AutoSQL Learn, but we also have AutoPyTorch. And we also have AutoPyTorch time series. And AutoPyTorch time series well looks at all kinds of different models for time series, some transformers, some LSTM, some classical methods, and just picks the best it can find for the particular data set at hand. But if there are companies outside and want to work together with you, they can contact you on this topic? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd be very interested. It also you know, bringing AutoML more to the small, medium companies. You know, uh, machine learning has really... It is a crucial technology and the big tech companies that can afford to hire experts in machine learning, they have reaped the benefit of this, um, the Googles and Apples and so on of this world, but sort of small and medium sized companies that might not be able to afford this big team of machine learning experts, um, but still have data. I think that's really a key thing I want to achieve with AutoML is really this democratization of machine learning to bring it out and to let everyone actually participate in this revolution of machine. And we have a lot of these companies in the Black Forest near Freiburg 
machine building companies uh, who can use that. That's great. Frank, it was a pleasure to talk to you. It was an honor to talk to you. Thank you very much and greetings to Freiburg. Thank you very much. My pleasure.